Now we're going to move on to making the electronic circuit which will control your NEMNET throb well. Before we start, I thought it would be useful to explain what the electronic circuit actually does. This is the clock movement that we'll use to accurately drive around the timer's clock hand. This movement is slightly different as it can trigger an electronic chime to sound each hour. That's what the wires that stick out of the case are for. We need an hour trigger so that when the Nempnet Throbwell's clock hand reaches zero, it will sound the horn. The way the trigger works is really clever, so I thought I'd share it with you. Inside the clock movement is the motor, a load of gears, and underneath everything a small pair of springy electrical contacts. These are moved once each hour by a small pin that sticks out of one of the gears. If you listen, you can hear the contacts spring together as the minute hand turns past the hour. The clever thing is that the pin doesn't push the contacts together, it pushes one apart, which then springs back, briefly touching the other contact before it comes to rest, giving a short trigger pulse. The problem is a short pulse of electricity probably won't even start the air pump turning, let alone sound the horn for a while, and this is why we need some electronics. The circuit takes the electricity from the batteries and sends it to the power switch so that we can easily turn everything on and off. When you first switch on your NEMPNET throb well, the circuit sends electricity to the clock movement so it can begin timing the required delay and also to the flickering lamp to let you know that's what it's doing. When the minute hand triggers the chime contacts, the circuit stops sending electricity to the clock movement and flickering lamp instead sending it to the air pump. It does this for about 20 seconds so as not to annoy the neighbours. Here it is working. So now you know what the circuit does, let's get on and build it. Don't worry if you're unfamiliar with electronics or are concerned it all looks too complicated. The kit and instructions have been carefully designed so you won't need any special tools or knowledge of components. I love electronics and really wanted to give kit builders the opportunity to build their own circuit. To build the circuit you'll need the electronics bits bag, a pair of scissors and a pair of long nose pliers. The vast majority of tool collections, however big or small, contain long nose pliers which generally include a wire cutting section. If yours don't, or are really blunt like mine, you could use side cutters instead. We just need a way of cutting copper wire without ruining a pair of scissors. Empty the bag, preferably into some sort of container so little bits can't get lost. The bag contains two circuit layout stickers to show you where the components need to go. There's two in case one sticks in the wrong place. A prototype breadboard, so named because it looks like bread, although, unlike bread, this one has 170 holes which lead to electrical connectors. The connectors are joined in strips which provide a useful way of developing electronic circuits as components can be swapped around easily. Importantly for us, it means the components don't have to be soldered together and if something ends up in the wrong place it can easily be moved. There's also some tinned copper wire. This is what we need the wire cutters for and a jig to help bend wire and components to the right length. Finally, there is a nice little selection of electronic components. Your circuit may have two extra components. If so, just follow the instructions and push them into place where shown on the circuit layout. These extra components can be inserted either way around. The funny looking thing is a piece of anti-static foam holding an integrated circuit and a semiconductor switch which will control the air pump. These components could be damaged by static electricity created when packaging rubs together, similar to rubbing a balloon against synthetic clothing. The foam just connects all the legs together to prevent the risk of damage. Firstly, get the scissors and cut around the outer line of the layout sticker. Easiest to then cut out the corners. One side is printed next to the edge of the label to make it easy to peel off the backing. Peel off the backing. Lay the label face down on a table and hold the breadboard, holes also facing down, above it. Line up one corner and then the second corner on that side. When everything seems to line up, lower the breadboard onto the sticker. 
If you don't press it down, it is possible to lift off the sticker for another go. Once it's in the right place, fold over the edges and push the label against the breadboard so it sticks properly. And here it is. Now get the supplied nail and puncture the label wherever there is a dot. This will help the legs of the components and wires push easily into the breadboard. We are now ready to start constructing the circuit. I suggest putting in the wire links first. These are represented as grey lines, hopefully with a hole at each end. Get the wire and straighten it out. You'll also need the wire bending jig and your wire cutters. Let's first make one of the small wire links. The smallest end of the jig is the correct size to link two holes. Line up one end of the wire with the back side of the jig so it runs along the slot up the side. Hold it in place while you bend the wire around the jig to form a U-shape. Cut the wire off level with the bottom of the jig. It should look something like this. It doesn't have to be perfect. All that matters is the ends poke far enough into the correct holes on the breadboard. The electrons really don't care what it looks like. Carefully line up the wire link with its drawing on your circuit layout and push it in. Some adjustment might be necessary to get it to go in smoothly. It may help to push the larger wires into the breadboard with your pliers. You can work out how long to make each link by moving the jig over the drawing of the required link on the circuit layout until the ends line up. This one needs to be nine holes wide. As before, line up one end of the wire with the base of the jig and hold it in place. Then bend the wire over the jig. Finally, cutting it off level with the base of the jig. Line it up on the circuit layout and push it down. Try and keep the wire links straight. If they bend around too much, they might touch another component, cause a short circuit and prevent the Nempnet throb well from working properly. Now carry on and measure, bend, cut and fit the rest of the wire lengths to your circuit. If it looks like this, or like this if you have the two extra components, well done. We can now start adding the electronic components. Really this is just the same as the wire links except there's a component in the middle of the wire. We'll start with the diode. Diodes only allow electricity to flow in one direction so they must be connected the right way around. This is indicated by a stripe at one end. If you look at the circuit layout you can clearly see a stripe at one end of the diode drawing. Use the jig to measure how long the diode needs to be. It's nine holes long, so just as you did with the wire links, do the same with the diode. And cut off the wire that extends below the thickness of the jig. This time you have two ends to cut, not just the one. It should look like this. Carefully line up the diode on the circuit layout, ensuring the stripe is at the correct end. Then push the diode down. Again, your pliers may help pushing it into place. It should end up looking like this. Now for resistors. These colourful little things slow down the flow of electricity, usually to make it do something useful. The coloured stripes tell you the value in ohms of the resistor. More ohms, less flow. Less ohms, more flow. The stripes are red with gold as the last one. This resistor's stripes are brown, black and red. This is a thousand ohm resistor, or like weights and distances, one kilo ohm. It doesn't matter which way around resistors go. So measure its required length, which is five holes. Bend it around the jig. Trim the excess wire. And it should look like this. Now line it up on the circuit layout and push it down. The second resistor has a brown, black and orange stripe, so its value is 10 kilo ohms. I'll put some more detailed information on the website about the electronic components in the kit for those who would like to know more. Bend and cut it in the same way. It too is five holes long. Line it up. Remember, it doesn't matter which way round resistors go. And push it in. The next resistor has a brown, green and brown stripe, so its value is 150 ohms. Do the normal bending and cutting, line it up and push it in. Next is a resistor with a grey, red and orange stripe. Its value is 82 kilo ohms. 
You know the score. Bend it, cut it, line it up and push it in. The two last resistors have the same value. They have an orange, white and brown stripe. Their value is 390 ohms. Remember, it doesn't matter which way round resistors go. The penultimate resistor is five holes long. But just to be confusing, the final 390 ohm resistor is seven holes long. If your circuit looks like this, you've done very well, especially if you haven't done electronics before. Now for the transistor switch. Pull it from the anti-static foam and lay it over the 5 width on the wire bending jig. This just happens to be the right length we need to cut its legs down to. Trim off the ends with the wire cutters. And then, below where the three connectors get narrower, use your pliers to rotate each connector through 90 degrees. It will help you to push the component into the breadboard. This component has to be connected the right way round. The circuit layout drawing indicates which side the metal part of the component should be. Line up the legs and push it firmly into the breadboard. The next component is the NE555 timer integrated circuit. And as you like wearing nylon clothing with plastic shoes and happen to be assembling the kit in a room with a synthetic carpet, I wouldn't worry about static electricity. Just hold the integrated circuit at each end and avoid touching the pins. Amazingly, the 555 has been around since 1972 and is considered to be the most popular integrated circuit ever produced. Anyhow, the NE555 timer must be connected the right way round. This is achieved by marking one end of the component with a recessed dot and or a recessed semicircle. Line it up carefully and gently push it into the breadboard. Look carefully to check that all eight legs have actually gone in properly and that none have bent underneath. Finally, the final three components. These are capacitors. They store electricity a bit like small rechargeable batteries. As such, they must be connected the right way round. This is achieved by having the negative wire indicated by a printed stripe of minus signs and arrow shapes. Because their wires come out so close to each other, we need to use the jig to bend them apart by don't push the capacitors down too far, just gently bend the wires over the jig and trim them as before, so they look like this. Note the minus signs on the circuit layout and make sure you put the capacitors in the right way round. The plain side just has some text on it, no minus signs. This is what all three should look like once they have been pushed in. Congratulations, you have assembled your Nipnet Throbwell electronic circuit. Double check that each component is in the right place, is in the right way round, its wires are properly inserted, and its wires aren't touching anything they aren't meant to. That's it for now. Keep your circuit safe until we need to install it.